I'm going to call this method 2B, approach 2B, because it shares something in common with this. Namely, I'm still going to gather everything on one side. So I'm going to gather everything in my inequality on one side to have a zero on the other side. But then, instead of multiplying by the square, I'm just going to leave it a rational function. So, watch. Let's have a go at this, right? Um, I'm starting with my first line again, right? Uh, 3 over x plus 2 is less than or equal to x. Let's do the gather on one side again. So I've got 3 on x plus 2 minus x, just like I had before. Now this time, uh, oh, I should, I should make everything so I'm trying to go above the axis. So, so far nothing is different from the previous approach, okay? But instead of multiplying through by a square and making this a cubic problem, okay? I just want this thing to be one function, right? So that I can then sort of graph it, work with it, all that kind of thing. But I don't want to multiply by a square. So here's what I'll do instead. I have a denominator. Just leave it as a denominator. And I'll make it a common denominator between these two things, okay? So if I want to add this to this, I'm going to have to multiply both things by x plus 2, okay? So I'm going to have this on this. Okay, happy time so far? All good. So remember, the reason why I didn't have to multiply by a square is because I didn't actually multiply both sides of the equation by anything. Um, I just changed the denominator of this term, which means it appeared on the new right. Okay, now let's expand <coughs> the top there. And you should be getting this awful sense of deja vu right now. Because you're like, I've seen this. I've seen this so many times. What is it? It's going to be x plus 3, x minus 1, right? We've seen this already. Now, why does this thing keep on coming up again and again? Not a rhetorical problem. Thank you. Okay. It's going to have the same factors no matter which way you slice it and move it around because the solutions are going to be the same. So therefore, the factors are going to be the same. Okay. You see the connection. It's not arbitrary. All right. So this is what I was getting at before, Nikita. If whichever approach you get, these numbers end up awful. They will be awful whichever route you take. Okay. Um, because whichever route you take, you'll end up with the same factors. There's more lines in the book, well, okay, so then the question becomes, what does this thing look like? So when is it greater than or equal to zero? Okay, now it's still a hyperbola, but it's a bit of a funky hyperbola. It's a bit different. Okay. So, let's have a go at this. Okay. Now, I'm going to give you a bit of an approach um, for how to graph rational functions in general. Okay. Um, it's a bit of a longer kind of explanation, and it's sort of peripheral to inequalities. Like, this is the main focus, okay? But I'm kind of digressing, because you will see these, okay? Um, my approach is an acronym. Um, Fair's a very old-fashioned word, um, because it's, it's come and taken sort of multiple meanings um, throughout history. Now we only really mean one meaning, which is like, I think it's equal. That's all we mean by it. It's not fair, you know? It's not equal. But fair actually used to mean something else. Anyone else? Know what it used to be? Some people still use it to mean this. Oh, like a fair, like a fun when you go and like fair. have like rides and stuff. Oh, yeah, okay, yeah, like a like a fun <laughs> fair. Okay, science. Science. not quite what I was thinking. Um, the oh, very yeah, like, very old fashioned yeah. meaning for fair is, like is um is well, it's sort of to do with skin like color, light. but it, it means it means beautiful. Uh, right? So if something is fair, it's it's attractive, right? So I want your graphs to be fair. <laughs> so we're gonna use yeah, not that kind. Of um, so I'm going to use this as my approach, all right, very conveniently. The letters stand for factorize, find your asymptotes, okay. find your intercepts, and then do some shading of regions. Okay, once you do all of those, you can graph very easily any rational function I throw at you, even ones where you know, this has got a linear denominator, which are kind of like the easiest type of rational function. But if you've got a quadratic there, a cubic there, any combination. All right, let's have a go. Factorize. <coughs> That's easy. We've done that already. In fact, you need the numerator and the denominator factorized. Here, you didn't have to do anything to the denominator, but just in case you get a, um, a square down here or a cubic down here, you can still factorize them. That's the first step. Okay, then you have to fa um, factorize and find your asymptotes by the factorization. Now, 
There are three kinds of asymptotes that we've met before, okay? But there are really only two. What's the one that we've looked at already in this question? X can't be negative <coughs> 2, right? This gives us a vertical asymptote, right? So vertical asymptotes are one kind of asymptote. They're where the function just can't exist, full stop. Okay? But then there are these other two kinds of asymptotes. Either horizontal asymptotes, which we've seen loads of them, right? Um, or their more messed up, complicated cousin, oblique asymptotes. Okay? So let me show you. It's important that we mention them because this one, this one, has one. Shh. Think with me, okay? Remember I said vertical asymptotes are about where the function can't exist, right? That, that means that's equivalent to a vertical asymptote. Horizontal and oblique asymptotes, even though they're also asymptotes, they come from a completely different reality, which is your function. Uh, here it is. Your function. What is it doing at its extremities? What is it doing at negative infinity? And what is it doing at positive infinity? Okay, that's all it tells you about, right? And this is very important. Let me just don't write this down, but I'll just give you a quick counterexample, <coughs> right? Um, there is a graph. I don't know the f na the equation. I think it's uh, x squared plus x on x, something like that. It's not complicated, but it looks like this. Um, okay, it's a pretty neat looking function. Okay, now just look at it with me for a second. Okay, does it have any vertical asymptotes? Uh, no, 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 not vertical. Yeah, no. Yes. Does it have any vertical asymptotes? What does a vertical asymptote mean? Oh, it's a place where the function can't exist. Okay. Just look at it. It's got arrows on it. But right? it might like it never touch y x equals. Sorry. It may never touch y x equals. Okay. Now, be careful here. Depending on the actual function you get, there might be a um, a hollow circle there, right? a place where it can't exist. But, but. It's not an asymptote. It's not a vertical asymptote. It doesn't do. It doesn't do this. No. It's not approaching it and getting closer and closer forever, but never getting there. It just. It just goes clean right through. It stops existing for a little while and then just keeps going. It's not an asymptote. Okay. It's not vertical anyway. But there is. Where does it go? Like what's after that? Like does it ever touch the? Okay. Well, according to the way I've drawn it, according to the way I've drawn it, right? There's a um. There's a horizontal asymptote. Okay, according to the way I've drawn it. Okay, but hold on a second. Look what happens in the middle there, right? I actually can craft a function where it just blows right through. Okay, you've got this horizontal asymptote, which apparently you can get closer to and never touch. And then in the middle here, they're like, yeah, forget that. I don't care. You know, I'm just gonna, um, you know, I'm gonna be the, I'm gonna be the hipster of the asymptote world. I'm just gonna go straight through. It's too mainstream. To right? Now, what's my point? We say asymptote as if you approach and you never get there, okay? The horizontal and oblique asymptotes only have that behavior at their extremities, at negative infinity and positive infinity. The horizontal and oblique asymptotes have nothing to do with the middle of your function. See? They don't tell you anything, right? Look, I'm going away from the asymptote. I don't give a rip what it's, what it's telling me. Only over here. Okay. So. Horizontal and oblique asymptotes, you work them out in a completely different way from how you work out vertical ones, right? Vertical ones, you just look at your denominators, right? And you say, look, it can't be there. So, negative two. Wait, so in the other example, would that actually be an asymptote? <coughs> Which example? You mean that this one? one? Yeah, would, that, would you actually call that an asymptote? It's a horizontal asymptote, absolutely. But it only tells the function what to do at the extremities. So it's actually kind of misleading that we draw it in the middle because it has no effect on the function in the middle. Okay? It's only at the ends. Okay. Now, like I said, this is how you work out a vertical asymptote. <coughs> but if horizontal and oblique asymptotes are about what's happening at really, really negative values and really, really positive values, the simplest way to work out what they're doing is by putting really, really positive values or really, really negative values into your function and see what happens. Okay? Now let's let's look at simple examples. Let's look at this guy. This is one on x. Okay? One on x. So when you put astronomically large numbers into x, a hundred, a thousand, ten thousand, ten million, okay? What's happening to this whole thing? It's getting tiny. Right? Now more specifically than it's getting tiny, 
right? I would say as x approaches infinity, one on x approaches zero. Okay. Now, just note, by the way, <laughs> this is a bit of a this weird thing. This is um zero with a plus on it because I'm approaching zero from a direction, namely from above. It's going to be 0 0.1, 0 0.01, 0 0.001. I'm always above though, always above. Now, as I go off in the other direction, something different's happening. As x approaches negative infinity, one on x is still approaching zero, but it's coming from another side, right? It's coming from underneath. Look, see? All of these values are going to be negative. So you have a zero with a negative sign on it, OK? All right, now, that's, that's the way you do it. What happens here? What happens here when you put in really large numbers? Right? Now, you can know right away it's not going to approach some nice, neat number. Because think about it. The reason this is approaching a nice neat number is because the denominator overpowers, if you like, it overpowers the numerator. Whatever the numerator is, the denominator will get bigger. So that's why I'm approaching zero. But it doesn't happen here, does it? The denominator is getting bigger, but the numerator will always outrun it, right? Because you have a quadratic here, degree two, and you've got a linear function here, degree one. So I'm going to approach, as x approaches infinity, right? our function, uh, let's call it f of x, it's also approaching infinity. That's not very useful, okay? Um, it's approaching infinity, but, but how is it approaching infinity? It doesn't tell us anything, right? And if, for example, I changed this, if I made that a plus, right? Would it still approach infinity? Yes. But would it do exactly the same thing? No, because it's a different function. So what you have to do is, and I'll get into more detail with this later. I'm not gonna. I don't want to get held up on it. You have to do some division of polynomials here. That's a that's a division there, right? This divided by that. Okay. Eventually, you'll discover in this particular case that what you're going toward is y equals x. Okay. Now it could be something else. It could be y equals x plus one or y equals two x. I'll dig into that another time when we're looking at rational functions in more detail. I'll give you a shortcut version as to why though. Before we wrote the rational function like this, okay, where did this come from? It came from all the way up here. See that? Look at this line carefully with me. As x approaches infinity, what happens to this? That guy there, that guy? That guy approaches zero, right? And then this guy, he said, no, that's okay. This guy just keeps on marching along at the same rate that x is. Right? That's why I'm approaching this. So just play a mind experiment with me. If suppose I made that a uh, 2, what would it be approaching as x approaches infinity? It would be approaching 2x, right? Because this thing is vanishing away, right? Let me play another mind experiment with you. What if I change, what if I change this number? Instead of 3, suppose I had 300 in there. What difference would it make? Answer. When I go to infinity, no difference. Infinity doesn't care about 300. Infinity laughs in the face of 300. It's like, ha ha ha, all your 300. I'm infinity, right? So this guy's still vanishing off to zero. Right? So that's a shortcut way of showing you. I'll, I'll show you more thorough ways later on. Okay. Stay with me. We factorized. We worked out the asymptotes. Okay. Now I want some intercepts. What are the intercepts of this thing? How do you find the intercepts? There's, there's two kinds, right? There's an x-intercept and there's a y-intercept. Okay. I can tell you right now that I've got a um, an x-intercept at negative three, okay. an x-intercept at one, somewhere over here, and then there should be a y-intercept. How do I find y intercept? I, I slap in x equals zero into there, right? And the easiest place to find that, I guess, would be here, here, yeah? because I've got zero there. That's easy. Minus three on zero plus two. That's negative one and a half. Huh? Does that number seem familiar? Yes. There I am. Just that is the negative. Good. 
Okay, so now I've done the intercepts. Okay. Last step. And in some senses, this is the weirdest step, but it's the most useful. Okay. Um, oh, if you. Is it like the union and the. Oh, kind of, kind of. Okay. Here's what I'm going to put through now, okay? If you have a pacer, this part will actually be harder. If you have a pencil, this will be easier. Um, I use pacers usually, so I'm in the hard work. I'm, I've got a whiteboard marker, so that's the equivalent of a pacer in this case. Uh, what I need to put onto here, this is my last step, is these three factors. See, this, this is one of the reasons why I factorize. Not just to find the asymptotes and intercepts, but also to find out where I go positive and negative. These are the regions I'm going to draw. Okay, so watch. I've got x plus 3, x minus 1, and x plus 2. Each one of these is a line. Each, there's three straight lines that make up this function. Okay. So I'm very quickly going to draw them in very lightly in pencil. Okay. So x plus 3, conveniently, actually not conveniently, it's no coincidence at all, goes through there. Okay. Goes through minus 3. Uh, x minus 1, conveniently, <laughs> goes through here. Okay. And x plus 2, conveniently, <laughs> goes through here, right where the um, asymptote intersects. Okay. Alright, now, let me do a thought experiment with you. Okay? Uh, if I give you these two numbers, okay, let's just multiply them. Negative 2 times 3 is? Negative 6. Negative six okay. How about uh, negative 2 times negative 3? Six. 6, right? Okay, now, just suppose you didn't know that there were 2 or 3 anymore. It was just a negative number times a positive number. Right? Even though you don't know the magnitudes, or should I say the absolute values of these numbers, you do know their signs, right? So even though you don't know if it's negative 6, you know it's going to be negative something, yes? Okay. Now have a look at this one, right? I've got two negatives. Now even though you won't know the magnitude of the answer, the absolute value, you can know that the sign of what you get at the end will be positive, because positive, two negatives give you positive. Now have a look over here. Actually, I'll do one more. What if I divide it? What if I divide it? It's the same, isn't it? Because actually, division is just multiplication in disguise. Okay? It's just a different kind of multiplication. Now have a look at my green lines. These are my factors here, right? What a good day you all. These are my factors. So over here on this side, I've got three negative factors. Three negative factors. So when I put them all together, what will their product quotient be? What sign will it have? It'll be negative, right? Because if I have three negatives, two of them will cancel out and one will be left. So here's now where I'm going to do a bit of shading. Okay? Down here, I'm below the axis. Wait, why? Okay? I'll say it again. Over here, I've got all three of my factors being negative. Yes? So when I put three negatives together, if I put together an odd number of negatives, I'll still be negative. Okay, now, I'm going to cross over a little bit. Okay. In between these two spots here, from negative three all the way over to negative two, what are the signs of my factors? Two positive, one negative. Hold on. Other way around. Negative, negative, positive. So when I've got two negatives and a positive, what's the result? It's a positive, isn't it? Okay. And you can start to see there's a bit of a pattern here. You can stop thinking about it, in fact. Because I go negative, then I go positive, and then I'm going to go negative, aren't I? All the way from negative two to the next factor. Okay. All the way in here, I've got two positives and a negative. So of course, I will be negative. Okay, last one now, over here, positive, 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 positive. the net result, positive. positive. Okay, so, <coughs> done, regions. Alright, that's it, now we're ready to draw a pretty line. Okay, so. They won't tell you to draw regions, but they will tell you to draw it accurately. You'll need to match up where it's going to go through. So watch. Okay. I'm going to use my asymptotes here as kind of like my guidelines. right? Uh, unfortunately, I, I need to have drawn this bit bigger, but that's okay. I can work with it. Right. Have a look to the left of the asymptote here. Look at the features that I know. 
I know I'm going to be positive here. That's an intercept, right? And then I'm going to be negative, and then I've got to approach this guy. Yes? So this is the line I draw. Okay, I know it's a bit straight because of the scale that I chose, but there is a bit of a curvature to it. In here, I'm going upwards. In here, I'm going toward this asymptote. Is that alright? Have a look to the right of the asymptote. What am I going to do? I'm going to do the same thing, but in reverse, right? I've got to be below the axis here, which makes sense because I've got an intercept there. I've got another intercept there, and then I've got to approach this asymptote, right? So I'm going through like so. You can kind of see the symmetry. I've done the best I can to meet all the features that I put on it. So, there's my graph. Okay. Why is it like a cubic? It's probably not a cubic. It's not a cubic. It's, it's, it's just that. Like you mean like an up down? Oh, you mean you mean this? You mean that? Is that what you're talking about? The regions? Oh, oh, you mean like in here? In here? I'm just trying to meet my points that I've already put in. So if I had done this in pencil, right, I would have maybe adjusted this a little bit so that I could just clearly go through. Okay. I would have preferred to have drawn something like that. But I couldn't meet the points that I'd put in before. <laughs> okay, there you go. All right. So all of that to say, now I have graphed this thing. Okay. Now I didn't have to graph it in full detail to be able to answer this question, but you will have to be able to graph these things later on. So that's why I thought I'd show you all in one here. Okay. Now let's answer the original question. When's this thing positive? Okay. In fact, we already done it by this step. You see that? Okay. I just want to know when this thing's positive, right? From here to here. There it is. See that? That's okay. And from here all the way across, just like we expected from our other two approaches. Okay. So, do you need to graph the whole thing in order to answer the question? No. But two things. Number one, <coughs> you need to be able to graph these things eventually. Uh, number two, being able to see what the actual shape of this thing looks like helps you to see, like, how did we graph this before? Look, it was a cubic. Does this cubic not look familiar? Which color am I going to use? I'll use black. It's kind of on me, right? How does this graph relate to that one? It's got the same factors, so it'll have the same regions. It's going to look like this. Right? It's kind of the same graph, but a different version. Of course it has to have the same regions, because they all came from the same thing. They all have the same solutions. 